Hello and welcome to Holy Impact Ministries Bible Study Night, a HolyImpactMinistries.com production. I'm Pastor Scott Vlaine. God bless you and thank you for sharing your time with us here today. We are moving into the last two chapters of the book of Romans and we have uh, completed our study on the book of Romans. Uh, and again, the book of Romans so important for us to know and understand because this is where the Apostle Paul gave us the instruction of what it means to be saved. What does it mean to be saved? What is the obedience of faith that he talks about in the first, very first chapter of the book of Romans? And uh, again, this is exactly what the book of Romans is all about, the instructions on how to and how not to actually partake in uh, the salvation offered to us by Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, uh, our Lord and our Savior, who was a propitiation for our sins. Uh, and an interesting, interesting book it has been. We're going to all be, also be moving into the book of uh, Acts coming up next. But uh, before we do that, we need to finish up our last two chapters of the book of Romans. Now, uh, I do want to uh, talk a little bit about what we've covered so far so that we can know and understand what it was uh, what was the, the context of the book of Romans and what Paul was trying to say in the book of Romans? So many Christians uh, and so many theologians today, so many evangelists today, completely missing uh, what Paul was talking about and being trained up and taught wrongly concerning the things of Paul. And uh, so many people believing that Paul was preaching and teaching against God's laws. Of course, we know better than that if we just sit down and take the time to read the text for ourselves. And uh, once again, for those of you who are just joining us here uh, this evening, I want to uh, bring up some of these proclamations that Paul was talking about throughout the book of Romans. So let's take a look at those very quickly and just go over them uh, very quickly. Romans 2.13, Paul says, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who are, are righteous, who will be justified. He also says in Romans 3.31, he asks the question, Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? He says, By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Three statements there, because he really wants us to understand. He says, Do we overthrow the law by this faith? He says, By no means. On the contrary, and we uphold the law. He just couldn't say it any more clearly than that. Romans 6, 1, he says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Romans seven twelve. he goes on and he says, So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. How many times have we been told that Paul believes that the law is a curse and it is bondage and all of these horrible things that we have been hearing uh, different men standing behind our pulpits preaching and teaching. What does he say and uh, go on to say in Romans 8, 7? He says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Why is it hostile to God? For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So here we are, we have Paul telling us that if you, uh, you, you are of a carnal mind, then your mind cannot uh, submit to the laws of God, and therefore you cannot please God if you are of a carnal mind. So if you believe that all God's laws are done away with and nailed to some tree somewhere, instead of written in your heart and in your mind, the way that Yahweh God tells us in Jeremiah 31, 31, and in Hebrews chapter 10, then you are of a carnal mind. So how many people are, are there out there? How many Christians today are of a carnal mind thinking that all God's laws are all nailed to some cross or some tree somewhere? So sad to know and understand what is happening to Christianity today. And again, Romans 8, 2, of course, this is what our Messiah came to die for. This is what he did do away with. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from what? From the law? No, not from the law. From the law of sin and death. 
And again, this makes it, Paul makes it very clear that this is what our Messiah came to die for. It was the law of sin and death, which was the penalty for sin. If you, what, is, what is the biblical definition of sin? Sin is the transgression of the law. And what is the wages of sin? The wages of sin is death. This is what our Messiah came to abolish or to do away with, to pay the price for so that we wouldn't have to. And this is what he did away with. Not the law of God, but the law of sin and death, the penalty of the law. And uh, something that, that so many Christians today, and I tell you, I cannot tell you how many of these uh, young slick-jawed uh, uh, young fellows coming out of seminary and Bible school completely miss these verses and really have no answer for these verses. When you ask them about these verses, they, they, they simply cannot reconcile these verses. They have no real answer for them. And they use words like, well, it's the principle of the Scripture, or that's not what the Scripture implies, or one thing or another. And they'll use all these different kinds of terminologies to get out of uh, what Paul tells us right here, all throughout, as you can see throughout the book of Romans, Paul was not teaching against the law of God. Again, Matthew 5.17 tells us very clearly, Matt, or, uh, our Messiah with his own breath, his own tongue, and his own words, said, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I came to do them. He says, and not the crossing of a T or the dotting of an I will pass away until heaven and earth pass away and all things are accomplished. So this is what we've been looking at throughout the book of Romans. And we are now moving down through the last two chapters, which is really where Paul begins to close things out. And uh, I, I want you to, uh, to share with us in these last two, two chapters. Now, if you have not been with us through this Bible study, I would like to invite you to please start at the beginning because there are so many different things through the book of Romans that you need to understand if you're going to grasp exactly what Paul was saying in the book of Romans and how it is that salvation does come to us. This is all laid out for us and mapped out for us in the book of Romans. So it's imperative that we understand this book and, uh, and especially before we move on to uh, the book of Acts. Okay. So let's go ahead with that and let's move into the last two chapters of the book of Romans, shall we? Romans 15:1. He says this. He says, "But we are the strong, but we the strong ones ought to bear the weaknesses of those not strong and do not please ourselves. For for let each one of us please his neighbor for good to build to building up. For also Messiah did not please himself." But even as it has been written, the curses of those cursing you fell on me. And again, you can find this in Psalm 69, 9. Again, quoting from the Torah. And in so much of this, I just want to say, if for those of you who haven't been with us, Paul continuously quoting from the Torah, quoting from the Torah, quoting from the Torah, co quoting from God's law all through the book of Romans, and he does it again here uh, when he quotes from Psalm 69.9. He continues on, and he says, in Romans uh, 15.4, he says, For whatever things were written before were written for our instruction. What's he talking about? Things that were written bef before. He's talking about God's laws, God's Torah, and the Tanakh. That's what he's talking about, the writings of the prophets. For whatever things were written before were written for our what? For our instruction that through patience and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And may the Elohim of patience and encouragement give you to mind the same thing among one another according to Yeshua, the Messiah. And I'm going to switch this over to the English Standard Version uh, because I have a lot of different things highlighted here. I wanted to, uh, to go over and I don't want to miss anything here. He says in, in Romans 15.5, he says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. 
For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised. Now, who is he talking about? He's talking about to the Jews and to the northern, uh, the, the northern kingdom of Israel who were scattered amongst the nations who God divorced and sent in, dispersed into the, uh, the north. Now, the Jews also uh, went into bondage, but, of course, the, the tribe of Judah came back along with some of the Benjamites. Uh, who, who was who Paul was part of? Paul was a, himself was a Benjamite, so he's talking about the Jews here uh, specifically who did came back or did did came back did come back, and he's talking about he's that Christ came to be a servant to them to the Jews and to the Northern Kingdom to bring them back and make the two sticks of Ezekiel one stick so that all the nations could be grafted together back into the olive tree that we see in Romans 11. So this is what he's talking about here. He says, For I tell you that, that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles also might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the, pro the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse, of course, this being our Messiah, will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. Now, I want you to look, and I have uh, in blue here, I have just kind of highlighted everywhere where it says hope. Uh, we find hope in uh, Romans 15.4. We find hope in Romans 15.13. We find hope in, actually, twice in 15.13. Uh, we find it, uh, let's see here, I thought there were a couple of more down here that I had. But you find hope kind of riddled all through this chapter. And again, this is exactly what Paul was talking about. You know, when we when we come to Yahweh God the Father, and we go to our prayer closets, and we get on our knees, and we say, Yahweh God the Father, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, I just want to know the truth. And I promise that if you give me the truth, I will do the truth. No matter what it costs, no matter what it is, no matter how difficult it is, if you will just show me the truth, I will do it. At this point in time, this is your first step to becoming a Christian. And so many, so many Christians today believe that simply coming down to the front of the, uh, of the aisle or to the, down by the pulpit or to the front of the stadium or wherever you are, or even sitting back listening to a radio program or someone on a YouTube channel, that they can pray a 60-second prayer with someone and they're saved. And it just doesn't work like that. You will not find one instance of that anywhere in the Bible, my friends, anywhere in Scripture. You will not find that. It's not. It, it does not happen that way, and that is not what being saved is all about. Now, that's a great first step to confess with your mouth that Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, is the Messiah. But we need to get into our prayer closets. We need to. It is a personal prayer that you must pray that says, you know what, Father, I just want your truth. I know that you exist. I believe who you are, who you say you are, and I want you to show me the truth so that I may do it, so that I may love you properly. What, again, is the biblical definition of the love of God? 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, if, if the commandments that we keep of God, because we love God, are not burdensome, then they're not work, are they? Absolutely not. You see, it all fits together nice and neatly if we know how to read the Scriptures and we just pay attention to what it is that we're reading and we ask Him for the discernment to help us understand. This, my friends, is the first step that you will take in a lifetime journey on your way to actually receiving the salvation of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ which is not achieved until the day of resurrection. So we need to know these things. And, and all through the, the, uh, the book of Romans, we find Paul talking about the hope, the hope, the hope, the hope. You know, the Gentiles have hope. May the God of 
hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Hope for what? Hope for the salvation that has been promised to us. And this is so very important for us to know and to understand. You know, the Bible tells us very clearly in the book of Hebrews, it says very clearly, if we decide to sin after knowing the truth, there is nothing left for us but the expectation of being thrown into the pit. And that's just all there is to it, my friends. Uh, we cannot just, can, after knowing the truth, knowing what Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, has done for us, if we continue to sin, we throw our salvation away. And the idea of once saved, always saved, Paul, time after time after time after time, just throws to the ground. That is a man-made doctrine, and it should not be uh, believed, and, it, and, and you should not believe in such things. Because if you do, and if you partake in that once saved, always saved doctrine, you will lose your salvation. And it is just that simple. Remember what the definition of the love of God is according to the Word of God. For this is the word, or this is the love of God. First John five three. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. And just one more time, while we're on that subject, I just want to go through this again. What does Paul say in Romans three thirty one? Right here, he says, "Do we then overthrow the law by this faith?" He says, "By no means. On the contrary." We uphold the law. Romans 8, 7 says, For the mind that set on the flesh is hostile to God. Why? Because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. He just continues to say these things over and over again. Romans 2, 3, It's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be righteous before God. So let us not, let us not be foolish about the message that Paul is delivering in the book of Romans. And I just want to really drill that uh, and nail that down tightly for anyone who might be new and has not uh, followed us through the book of Romans. And I, once again, if you don't understand these things and these things don't sound right to you and no one has ever told you these things before, please start at the beginning of the book of Romans in our study and follow us through the study. Again, you can find this whole study on the book of Romans at holyimpactministries.com. Just go to our HIM Bible study page and you'll find the whole, all of the listings from Romans 1 all the way down through. And uh, it really doesn't take that much time to go through, but I think you will really benefit from taking this if you've never heard these things before. Okay, so, very good. Uh, let's go ahead and continue on. He says, may the, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Again, Paul here commending them for being filled with all knowledge. How do we become filled with all knowledge? Well, number one, we have to uh, begin to do the things of God. We have to have the obedience of faith, and we have to understand what is the obedience of faith. We've covered that before here uh, in the book of Roman on, and Romans, and I won't go into it again here for the sake of those who have been through it several times now. Uh, but you can see that again in our previous chat in the previous chapters that we have studied. There is an obedience to faith. God's laws are not nailed to some cross somewhere. They are to be written in our hearts and in our minds because of what Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, did at the cross in taking the penalty of sin and death away from the law. Not Again, again not doing away with the law, but doing away with the penalty of the law and being a propitiation for our sins. Okay, he continues on in Romans 15, 15. He says, but on some points I have written you to be very boldly by the way, by way of reminder. Okay. He says, but of the grace given me by God. Let's read that again. But on some points I have written you, I have written to you very boldly, by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Again, Paul making it very clear that Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, came for the lost sheep of Israel. That's why he said he came. Once he came 
And once he died on that cross, the two sticks of Ezekiel, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, were once again put together in one stick, one kingdom. They were no longer two houses. They were one house. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom were once again melded together and again remarried to her groom. Uh, remember, she was divorced. The northern kingdom was divorced uh, from God. So this is how it all works out. Once they were together, then the apostles could once again gather the Gentiles into the olive tree. But the first thing that Yeshua had to do is put together the olive tree, put the olive tree back together and make it one tree. And that's why he came to die on the cross as a propitiation for all sins of all people. And now, if we read the 11th chapter of Romans, as we have already studied, we know and understand that we are grafted into that olive tree, the Israelite people, the only people in the Bible, in the Scripture, anywhere, that God ever calls His people. There is no other people on the face of the planet that God calls His people other than the Israelites and those who are grafted into His chosen people and become His bride. And we need to know these things, and it's very easy to know and to understand these things if we just, again, study to show ourselves approved. And let's continue on. He says, Romans 15, 17, In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be very proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. How many times have we heard from people, so many lost, poor lost souls, I'm not, I am not saved by works, I don't have to do any works, Jesus did it all for me, and I don't have to do anything. What does Paul say right here? Let's read it again. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to what? To obedience by word and deed. He has written his laws in our hearts in our minds, and we are obedient to them, not to be saved, not to earn our way into heaven, but because we are saved. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. They're not work to us, my friends, because we have the Holy Spirit. We look forward to keeping the things of God, and we look forward to his coming kingdom. And once again, we are practicing with each one of the feast days and the Sabbath days that we have for that millennial kingdom. Because when it comes back, all of the laws of God will be reinstituted. And so we need to know this. We need to understand this. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And for us to believe that God cared about his laws in the beginning, he doesn't care about them now, but then he cares about them again at the end, is preposterous. It's nonsense. Absolute nonsense. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He doesn't change hats. The laws of God have not been erased. The penalty of the law, of breaking the law, has been paid in debt. It has been signed, and the new covenant has been signed by our Messiah. The terms are exactly the same, my friends. The terms are exactly the same as the old covenant. The new covenant is only new because it is now signed in the blood of the Lamb, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. And the propitiation, the, the penalty for breaking the law, is no more, because that, that fine has been paid by our Messiah. This does not mean, as he says in Matthew 5.17, that he did away or abolished the law. He most certainly did not. And anyone who says that he did ob abolish the law is calling our Messiah a liar. You can't read Matthew 5.17 and then turn around and say that he did abolish the laws. He says very clearly, not the crossing of a T or the dotting of an I will, be, will pass away from the law until heaven and earth pass away and all things are accomplished. Well, all things are not accomplished yet, my friends, and we are still standing on the earth. So if you want to call our Messiah a liar, go ahead, but I don't recommend you do that. Uh, again, we need to pay attention to what he said with his own breath, with his own words, and with his own voice. And what Paul proudly proclaims here today in Romans 3.31, Do we abolish the law by our faith? Absolutely not. On the contrary, 
we uphold the law. And this is what he's talking about when he talks about bringing the Gentiles to obedience, bringing them back to the law so that they can understand it and know it, and they can have it written in their hearts. And the, the law actually means something to us because of what his son did at the cross. It is not by works that anyone is saved. When Paul talks about a, a, the curse of the law, he's talking about what Yeshua did away with, the penalty of the law. That was the curse of the law, my friends. Not the law itself. The law is perfect and holy. What does Paul say very clearly right here? Romans 7:12. he says, So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and it is righteous, and it is good. Anybody who believes that the law is bondage or a curse needs to read Psalms 119. Uh, again, read it for yourself and understand what the law of God is and what it means to Yahweh God the Father. If we don't understand these simple things, my friends, then we have not made it to the first rung of Christianity. Okay, let's continue on uh, here with the uh, 15th chapter. Romans 15, 19, he says, By the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Elycrium, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard him will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia uh, Achia have been pl pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to him. Now listen to what Paul says here. This is very interesting what he says here in Romans 15, 27. He's talking about this, 15, 26 and 27. He's talking about uh, this contribution that they were making. Uh, and, it, and let's read that again. For Macedonia and Achaia have... Achaia, Achaia, have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought to also be of service to them in material things. So again, we are commanded that if we are being fed the Spirit, and we are being fed the truth of God's word, that we should support that word going forward. And that's what he's saying here. For if the Gentiles have, if Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual beings, they ought to also be of service to them in material blessings. And he's talking about offerings that he is taking to them. So it's important for us to know, and it's important for us to understand these things. You know, God's, God's word cannot move forward if there is not a ministry, if there is, there are not people spreading the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. And that, my friends, like everything and anything else, costs money. Uh, and we hate to talk about money. We None of us like to talk about it. And, and when we talk about the uh, offering plate going by at church, oftentimes people scoff. They don't want to have anything to do with it because we've seen these men who fly around in their personal jets and they have a house in Florida and they have a, a house up uh, in California and, and uh, these big shots just drive around all over the place uh, in their three-piece suits and, and all of this garbage. And, and they spend the money that is given to them for their ministries on themselves more than they spend on the body of Christ and on God's people. And people are sick and tired of it. But let that not make our hearts grow cold. We need to be able to support those who are speaking and teaching the truth. So I just wanted to say that. Let's continue with Romans 15, 28. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ, the Messiah. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord 
Jesus Christ, and by the love of his Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Now it seems like Paul is closing out his letter here, but not quite. We still have one more to go through here. And this is kind of like a, a PS uh, here at the end. He says, I commend, I commend you to our sister Phobe, a servant of the church of Kenre, Centre. I'm sorry, Centre. Some of these words uh, in these older towns and some of these names are very difficult to explain. Tongue twisters. Again, let's read that again. I commend you uh, to our sister Phobe, a servant of the church at Centre, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. And remember, you know, Paul was beaten several times. He was robbed several times. He was whipped several times. He was shipwrecked several times. Uh, Paul has been through a laundry list of persecution. And there are those people that were out there that were trying to kill him and absolutely just wanted to, to kill him and get rid of him. And uh, just like they did Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Remember, it was the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes that wanted Pilate to kill, to crucify Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And when they heard Paul and Peter and, and the rest of the apostles preaching and teaching, they did the same thing to them. They jailed them, they whipped them, they beat them, and they plotted to kill them. So Paul, uh, again, is constantly uh, going from town to town and running for his life in some cases. So again, this uh, Priscilla and Aquila uh, have actually risked their lives is what he's saying for them. So that's what he's trying to tell them here. He says, Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Apanetius, who was the first con convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary also, who has worked hard for you. And he goes down this laundry list of names of people that he is now bringing into the church and introducing and many people that were actually have traveled with him and have helped him in his travels and he comes down to romans 16 17 and he says i appeal to you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught avoid them now what's he talking about here He's talking about people that are creating divisions, okay, by uh, introducing another doctrine other than the one he gave them, contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. He says, avoid them. If they're teaching something else besides what I taught you, avoid them. He continues, he says, for such persons do not serve the Lord Christ, but their own appetites and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. So Paul warns again, there are already in his time, are people coming into the church and they are making uh, uh, the word of God into lasciviousness. And we were warned this, even in the book of Jude, we're warned this. We warned this by the Messiah. He says, don't let anyone deceive you. Uh, over and over and over and over again, we hear these warnings of these ungodly people coming into the church, these wolves coming in to scatter the flock, coming in to teach and preach an offshoot or a little, something a little bit different than what Paul was teaching, trying to preach and teach that God's laws are null and void and, and nailed to the cross. You see, they were already coming into the church, already. And that's exactly what where we are today with the modern-day version of Christianity. We have these people that have come in. They are teaching things that are contrary doctrine to what Paul taught. And by their smooth talk and their flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive who don't study, who don't look at the text, who don't know what Paul was preaching or what Paul is said or his proclamations concerning the law and keeping the law and the fact that we do not uh, nullify the law by our faith. And in fact, we uphold the law. They will teach everything and anything uh, 
contrary to what Paul was uh, teaching. And that's what we have today, my friends. So we must be on guard about these things. Okay. Romans 16, 19, he says, For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason and Sisipater, my kinsmen. I, Ter Teretus, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Estrus, the city treasurer, and our brother, Quartus, greet you. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel in the preaching of Christ Jesus, according to the revelation of the mystery that has been kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. The obedience of faith. There it is again. He opens up with the obedience of faith in the first chapter of the book of Romans. And here he is at the very last line, closing out, making mention of the obedience of faith. Oh, I don't have to do anything. I don't, I'm not responsible for any works. James 4.4 4 says that faith without works is dead. James, the brother of Yeshua, says, As the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead. We can know this and understand this all through the, the Word of God. When Paul talks about the works of the law, he's talking about evil works. He's not talking about good works. He's talking about evil works. Because there were those Pharisees and those Sadducees and those of the circumcision group who wanted to do the law and believed that the law, basically the law, was their God, apart from the faith in Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. They didn't feel like they had to have faith in the Messiah. All they had to do is do the law. And this is where people were completely uh, distorted in their thinking and did not understand. This is exactly what God wanted from the very beginning. From the very beginning, Yahweh God was trying to impart his laws and his commandments and, and his moedim to the Israelite people so that it would be in their heart and in their mind. But they obeyed it like it was works. It was something work that they had to do, and that earned them into heaven. And Paul was trying to break the back of that theology and help the Pharisees to know and understand, listen, if you don't have faith in the Messiah, you cannot get to, into the coming kingdom by keeping the law because you don't have that propitiation for sin. You're always, if you, break, if you tell a white lie, you've broken the whole law. So you can't keep the law without faith in the Messiah. Now, if you have faith in the Messiah and you break the law, you can come to the Father and be through the Son. And it's the only way that you can come unto the Father is through the Son. No one comes unto the Father but through me, he says. And we can ask for forgiveness and we can turn away from that sin because we have the Holy Spirit of God in us. And that Holy Spirit will guide us to be obedient to the things of God and have the obedience of faith. That's what the obedience of faith is, my friends. There is a difference between evil works and good works. And once again, if uh, the Bible is correct in what it says, in its biblical definition of the love of God, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome to us, then they're not work to us, are they? Of course they're not. We look forward to the Sabbath. We look forward to the feast days. We look forward to the coming kingdom. Because all of these things, all of these Moedim, all of these feast days, and we're talking about Passover and first fruits and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and, and uh, uh, Pentecost, and, and all of these feast days are going to be reinstituted when he returns. So we are practicing and we are keeping these things the best that we can so that we are ready. We will be ready for him when he comes. We will be well rehearsed because we will have been keeping these things all the time. And by doing these things, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and they're not burdensome. 
So Paul, again, closing his letter out uh, no, with no surprise, talking about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forever there, forevermore through Christ Jesus. Amen. So, and we are done with the uh, 15th and 16th with the book of uh, Romans. Now, once again, I just want to put this up here for uh, those folks who may be new, just to kind of glance through some of these while I'm speaking to you. From the very first paragraph, Paul begins talking, uh, once again, about the obedience of faith. And from there, he continues to talk about the law separate and apart from faith. And Paul proclaims over and over again that we do not abolish the law by our faith. On the contrary, we uphold the law. He states clearly that, that the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Why? Why is it hostile? Because it does not submit to God's laws. Indeed, it cannot. So if you are of a carnal mind, if you are of a fleshly mind, if you are assimilating yourself uh, with the rest of the world, then you cannot please God. That's all there is to it. What does James say? He says very clearly, he says, he says, you foolish person, do you not know that if you are a friend of this world, you are an enemy of God? Do you not know this? Again, pretty much sums it up. Very easy to understand if we just read the text. We just need to read our Bibles. That's all we need to do instead of listening to some man standing behind a pulpit. Uh, it, it, is, it is so confusing to have these people that are, that are coming out of these seminary schools and Bible colleges. We have to be wise as serpent and as, as kind as doves, my friends. And, and as I've said many times, there are over 5,000 different Christian denominations. Each one of these seminary schools, each one of these colleges, each one of these buildings that they go into to be anointed by men are teaching their denominational doctrine. Whatever that charter is, whatever that charter says, whatever that belief is, that's what they're teaching. And they're coming out of those places, going into these different churches, and they are preaching and teaching that denominational charter's doctrine. They are not preaching the Word of God. In order for a denomination to become a denomination, it has to have something a little bit different than every other denomination. So we know we have these men coming out of these uh, seminary schools who have, uh, have more degrees than a thermometer in eschatology and etym et uh, etymology and hermeneutics and exegesis and, and philosophy and all of these things. And they don't understand, just like the Sadducees and the Pharisees, well-educated, just like Paul himself came from Tardis, Tartus, where within, in that city was the academic uh, capital of the world. He knew the writings of Plato and Socrates and Aristotle. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Paul was a wise man. He spoke three different languages and still could not see the Messiah standing right in front of him. He couldn't see it until Yeshua knocked him off his horse struck him blind to where he had to be led around like a dog until he finally understood who the Messiah was. With all his brilliant education, he could not see the Messiah until he knocked him off his horse and struck him blind. And that's exactly what we have going on today, my friends. We have these, these men who think that they're, they're higher learning and their Platonistic thinking, you see, is so much more superior to, to your that you can't understand the Bible, you see, unless you have my degrees in philosophy and uh, eschatology and, and, uh, and hermeneutics and exegesis and all of these different classes and things that they take. And they twist and they turn the scriptures around and they say, well, this is what the scripture implies. And you'll catch them saying this all the time. I don't care what the scripture, you think the scripture implies, my friend. I care what the scripture says. What does it say? I don't want to hear what about what you think it implies. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. You know, it doesn't matter what you believe. What matters is what is written, what is truth. We are to worship God in spirit and in truth. And we can only get that from him. And that's why he tells us, Matthew 23, 8, Call no man rabbi on this earth, because you, have, you are all brothers and you have one teacher. And call no man father on this earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. And call no man your instructor on this earth, for you have one instructor, the Christ. And this is exactly why we always say the same thing at HolyImpactMinistries.com. 
We said, go to your prayer closet and ask for this discernment. You must ask him for it, and he will give it to you, and you will understand. And this is so very important for us to do. It's so, so very important for us to do. So, it was not the law that Yeshua came to abolish, just like he said in Matthew 5.17. I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I came to fulfill them. I came to do them. Fulfill does not mean end or abolish. He uses abolish and fulfill in the same sentence. He came to do one and not the other. He says, I did not come to abolish. He said, I came to fulfill the law. And he says, he nails it down tightly, the very next scripture after that, the next sentence. He says, not the crossing of a T or the dotting of an I will pass from the law until the heaven and earth pass away and all things are accomplished. Heaven and earth is not passed away yet, my friends. We are still waiting for that. And all things certainly have not been accomplished. And so, in other words, just as I said, unless we are calling our Messiah a liar, we can know that he did not come to abolish the law, not to change the crossing of a T or the dotting of an I. Now, let me, and let me, let me put this in your hearing as well while I'm closing this out. For those of you who believe that Sunday, the first day of the week, is the Sabbath, the seventh-day Sabbath of God, the sanctified, holy Sabbath of God, the day that he said would be a sign between him and his people, a perpetual agreement for all generations, for those of you who think that Sunday is the Sabbath, you, I want you to go back and I want you to look very closely at Matthew 5.17. I did not come to change the crossing of a T or the dotting of an I of the law and not the crossing of a T or the dotting of an I will pass away from the law until heaven and earth pass away and all things are accomplished. My friends, seventh day Sabbath remains God's seventh day Sabbath. Now you can meet on whatever day you want to meet on. That's fine, but don't call it God's seventh day sanctified holy day that is a sign between us and him and a perpetual agreement for all generations because it is not there is one day called by god his sabbath day and that is the seventh day sabbath it was the seventh day sabbath on in jesus time it was the seventh day sabbath when the roman catholic church changed it and we know that throughout our history books and it's the same seventh day sabbath today we know exactly what day the seventh day sabbath is and so do the Jews of today who have been keeping the letter of the law for so many years. So, let no one fool you, my friends. Just do a little bit of homework to no one understand these things. Uh, and it is in our history books. The Roman Catholic Church changed the seventh day to the first day. It's in all of our history books. Google it for Pete's sake. And do your homework and no one understand how things got changed was indeed the Roman Catholic Church. And the Protestant churches are the daughters of the Roman Catholic Church, who say they have nothing to do with her, but yet follow all of her command-made commandments, all of her laws, all of her, her Christmas and Easter and Good Friday, all of this man-made trash, garbage, nothing but man-made trash and garbage. My friends, that's what it is. And what did our Messiah tell the Pharisees and the scribes? That we're doing the same thing, overwriting God's laws with their own laws. What did he tell them? He says, you have made void the word of God to hold on to your own traditions. And what did he call them, and the pastors and the priests and the bishops and the popish leaders of his time? Matthew 23. Read Matthew 23. He called them, you blind guides, you whitewashed tombs, you twofold children of hell, you brood of vipers. He had every contention for the pastors of his time. My friends, our pastors that we live in uh, today in our modern time are no different, many of them. Many of them, not all of them, but many of them. Still teaching and preaching the doctrine of demons. It is doctrine of men making void the word of God to hold on to their own traditions, exactly what we were warned about. And if we read Deuteronomy 12.32, we can know and understand that God says very clearly, Be careful, be careful to do all that I command you, and do not add to it, and do not take away from it, because he knew that these ungodly men would come in to scatter the flock and to lead his people astray. 
My friends, the book of uh, Revelations tells us very clearly, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her plagues, because her iniquities are heaped as high as heaven. And God has remembered her iniquities. So unless we want to share in her plagues, we need to come out of her. What is the her? The her is the false religion that we are so severely bound by today. And I hope and I pray, Father, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, that those who are watching this video will know and understand exactly what Paul was preaching in the book of Romans. And it was, there's nothing in Romans 14 about changing the Sabbath day. It's about food and fasting. And there's nothing in Romans 13 about uh, obeying the government and everything that it says when it starts teaching and preaching things against the laws of God. We are to obey and to not cause dissension as long as the laws that are of the land do not break God's laws. When they break God's laws, we are not bound to those laws. No, I don't care what man makes them. Uh, we, and we've covered all this throughout the book of Romans. There are so many things to know and understand. Who you are as a Christian can be found in Romans 11. What is faith exactly? What is faith? What is faith? Is it just saying, I believe, I believe? Is that what it is? Not according to the Apostle Paul, it is not. There is an obedience of faith. We know what that is. Again, we encourage you, if you have not heard these things, you have not seen these things, take this course in the book of Romans. Test the scripture. Go to your prayer closet and ask for the discernment to understand. It's important, my friends. We are living in the end times. Right now, the sand is leaving the hourglass as we speak. We need to stop dabbling around, dancing with the devil in the pale moonlight with flying reindeer, magical elves, Easter bunnies that lay eggs, and know and understand. The Yahweh God the Father has commanded us to be careful to keep His commandments, His appointments, His Moedim, and not to add to them, and not to take away from them. It's important, my friends. And when we do these things, and when we understand that the love of God is keeping His commandments, and that His commandments are not burdened to us, that's when our lives change. That's when things start to happen. That's when the spokes in the wheels start to move and the wheels in our lives start to finally turn. And that's when he comes to us and makes his home inside of us, just as he said he would. He told us, he said, I will not leave you. I will be with you. But we have to understand what Paul was teaching and preaching. What is the gospel message? The gospel message is, is, the, is the greatest commandment. What did Yeshua say the greatest commandment was when the apostles asked him? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. Where did he get that? Did he just make that up? No, he got it from the Torah, the sixth chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. Think about them when you walk by the way, when you get up, when you lie down. Write them as a sign on your hand. Bind them as a sign on your hand. As frontlets between your eyes. Write them on your doorposts and the gates of your houses. Teach them diligently to your children. He got that from the Torah. The Torah, my friends. The law of God. Again, that is the greatest commandment. And the second like it, to love your brother. To love him enough to tell him the truth, not to dance with the devil with him. You don't. We don't. We don't love somebody if if they're if they're if they're in danger of losing their very lives and losing the salvation that our Messiah came to give them. We don't dabble in it with them. We don't. We don't throw our toss our pearls to swine. We don't do that. We tell them, say, look, brother, you're not understanding this correctly. Please re re look re study these scriptures. Take a look for yourself at what it says. Don't just sit in church on the wrong day of the week listening to some guy you barely know preach out of the back half of the book while programming you not to read the first half because he doesn't want you to know. He wants to be the authority. He wants to be over you, you see. And that's what it's all about. These Read the 23rd chapter of Matthew and no one understand. There's nothing different between the Sadducees and the scribes and the Pharisees of Yeshua's time who were the pastors priests, bishops, and pope, popish leaders of their time. Same people that we have today, my friends. Nothing's changed. What did Solomon say? There's nothing new under the sun. It's all been done before. 
And we have evidence of that. You just have to read our Bible to know these things. No one read the book of Jude, understand the warning of these men, these ungodly men who are coming into the church with their lasciviousness and their greater thinking. My friends, please pray to God. Ask for the discernment. That's why we went through this whole book of Romans, to help you understand the truth of God's word. You can know these things. You can understand these things. Yes, they can be difficult. Peter tells us that the, the right in three Peter, Second Peter 3.16, Peter tells us, he said, the writings of Paul are hard to understand. And he tells us, he said, the unstable and the ignorant will twist the writings of Paul to their own destruction. He says, so be careful. He warns us. He says, be careful that the lawless people, lawless people out there do not steal away your stability. And it's important for us to know that warning. We need to hear that warning. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult to understand without praying for the discernment. But once you understand it, you'll look at these scriptures completely different. And you'll look at these lists of proclamations that Paul makes throughout the book of Romans. And you will look at the book of Romans much, much differently. And you'll have such a clear insight as to what the truth of God's word is and the truth of what Paul was preaching that you'll never turn back. You'll know what the truth is, and you won't let these, these uh, blind guides, these whitewashed tombs, these brood of vipers who believe that in all of their, with all of their degrees and their higher learning that they've got it all sewn up, trying to teach you all of this wicked garbage and, and to drag you by the scuff of the neck and your family back into paganry and paganism things that God detests. We need to come out of these things. Once again, my friends, the sand is leaving the hourglass. It's important. We need to share these things. And again, this particular video is free for the download. Everything we do at HolyImpactMinistries.com is free for the download. Download it, share it, burn it to a DVD, do whatever you like with it. Take it to your Bible study. Start a Bible study in your home. Please start them in your homes. These brick-and-mortar churches are going to go away. They are already under attack, and they are going to go away. And anyone who preaches, preaches or teaches the truth of God's word, prepare, because we will be persecuted, as the word of God says. We need to prepare now. We need to prepare our children now. We need to know what the truth is, and we need to stand. We need to stand by putting on the full armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the, the, uh, the, the uh, sword of truth, the, the, the shield of faith, by which we can extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one, so that we can stand in the evil day. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. We must have these things, my friends, because we are in a spiritual war against principalities in high places, just like Paul says in the sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians. So please, let this be an encouragement to you, and I, and I hope and I pray that this teaching and this, of this book of Romans has been a blessing to you. I pray that if you are confused about these things, if you're not understanding these things, and uh, we, we, are, we have come to the end and you still have questions about these things, feel free to email me, Pastor V at HolyImpactMinistries.com. But more importantly, more importantly, ask him for the discernment. You know, the book of Ephesians tells us, Paul tells us that, that uh, Yahweh God the Father has given us teachers and pastors and, and, and people to, to show us and to help us to upbuild the body of Christ so that it may come to maturity. But he is the ultimate instructor. The, these men are not your father, and they're not your ultimate instructor. He is the instructor that teaches. And if I do not have him in me, then I've got no business teaching or even preaching or telling you anything. And we need to test the fruits of those people who are teaching. We need to test the fruits of those people. And we need to take what they're saying, what I am saying to you. Take it to the Father. Take it to the Father. Go to your prayer closet. Lock yourself in. Fall to your knees. And ask him. Pray that prayer that is so very important. And just say, Father Yahweh God, please, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, you must ask him in that name. Because it is only by that name that we can come to him. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, please show me your truth. Show it to me, and I promise that I will do your truth, and I will do it, whatever it is, whatever the cost, I will do it if you will show it to me. 
That, my friends, is the first step in your journey to salvation. With that being said, I just want to thank you so very, very much for spending your time with us here today. That is our uh, our closing of the book of Romans. Again, we will be looking at the book of Acts next. I think you're going to find that extremely important because the book of Acts is right after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John comes Acts. This is when the, the, the Christian church uh, is born. And we see and we can know and we can understand that all of us together, the, the Israelites, are Christians. And Christians are Israelites. We can see and we can know that we are all grafted into the same olive tree. There's just no getting out of it. And you can look at Galatians and no one understand. What does it say there? It says, if Christ is in you and you are in Christ, then you are the offspring of Abraham and heirs to the promise. Well, you can't be an offspring of Abraham, my friends, unless you're an Israelite. So we need to know and understand that we are part of the 12 tribes of Israelite who are Christians. You see, there is no... A true Jew is a Christian, and a Christian is a true Jew. We are one and the same, and we can know these things if we study the scriptures to know and to understand how it is we are all melded and welded together, and we know who that holy root is. It is our Messiah. And again, we if you don't know that, study the 11th chapter of the book of Romans. Study the book of Galatians. Study uh, what is said in the scriptures and stop letting someone tell you things that are not true without testing them. Test these things. Take them to your prayer closet and ask for the discernment. With that being said, God bless you, my friends. Uh, I, I love you and I thank you so very much uh, for the time that you have spent here with me. And my hope and my prayer is that the grace and the peace of God would be with you and your family and that the hand of God, Yahweh the Father, would be upon you and keep you safe until we meet again. We will see you uh, this next set coming Saturday. We have a live event uh, Friday night, actually Friday night, not Saturday. Friday night, the beginning of the Sabbath at sundown Friday, of course, is when the Sabbath begins. At 9 o'clock, we will be live. All you have to do is go to our uh, uh, webpage at holyimpactministries.com and you will see our live event there. There is a, a link that will take you right to our live Seventh-day Sabbath uh, event. And we will see you there in the chat rooms, my friends. God bless you. Thank you for sharing your time with us again here today. And Shalom. If you were blessed by this teaching, please consider helping us reach the nations by making a donation today. Thank you. And Shalom.